Hi, software engineers. Hope you're doing well today. It's a good day to wear a mask. Got two of my favorite children's book characters here. Elephant and Piggy, Gerald and Piggy from, from Mo Willems, who... Gerald's wearing a green mask, which is just fun from playing with the green screen. But, um, family set of these shirts, because, you know, I have my Gerald voice, my Piggy voice, whenever I'm reading to Sammy, but, uh, hope you're having a good day. I'm trying to have a good day myself. And I am, because I can talk to you about, or about software process, which I love doing. In the last video, we left off talking about, well, what does it mean to have a process? When you're building software with a large team and or, or just having a larger project, you just can't sit down and just slam out code and hope that it just works. You have to follow some steps. You need a plan. You need to say, okay, I need to know what the customer needs. I need to design. I need to, you've heard me say the phases enough times, requirements, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance. One of the telltale signs of a difference between an agile process and a plan-driven process, well, turns out to be requirements. Um, in an agile process, you expect to have more interaction with the customer. You expect to be able to go back to the customer, show new versions back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, when we talk about agile, we'll talk about how agile is meant to be a, a conversation with the customer. That doesn't always work. I mean, that sounds lovely, but it doesn't always work. If you're building something huge, like Microsoft Word, you can't call up everyone that uses Word and say, hey, how's that merge, you know, mail merge working out for you? It, you can do focus groups, you can do surveys, you can do a bunch of different things, but to actually come up with the requirements, you have to be a little bit more selective. Sometimes it is gonna come from marketing. Sometimes it is gonna come from the business group. Sometimes it will come from, you know, those small groups. What about software that you need to make sure you get it right? So software that's going to run a pacemaker, software that's going to fly a spaceship, fly an airplane, run air traffic control, Name your type of mission critical security, you know, life is on the line sort of software. And you're going to look at probably needing to use plan driven development. So Barry Bain said that plan driven methods work best when developers can determine the requirements in advance. And when the requirements remain relatively stable with chain rates on the order of 1% per month. If you're looking for one indicator, I need to be more plan driven. Versus I need to be more agile, it's the requirements chain. If you have a customer that is going to be changing requirements constantly, well, that probably means the software isn't as mission critical. It probably means it's an evolving thing. It probably means that they are open to revision and things like that. And that's going to make it more agile. But if upfront they say, no, we are working with this piece of hardware and it's going to go into a person or it's going to go into an airplane and it must work exactly this way, then you're probably going more plan driven. Now, just because you're plan driven doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Plan driven is an extremely important way of thinking about building software. And, and it's not that when you say plan driven, you can't have some of the quote unquote benefits of being agile. It's on a continuum. You have agile to plan driven. And the different um, practices that you do span that continuum. So just because we say something is more plan driven doesn't mean that it is going to be devoid of fun and life or whatever sort of stereotype you have of this sort of development. I mean, when I say plan driven, some of you probably think of suits and ties and cubicle farms and, and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, maybe that's not completely incorrect in some ways, but that's more because the culture of, an, of a company happens to match the development methodology. It, it's a correlation, not a causation. So um, the, the things that we look at when we're looking at a plan-driven methodology, they focus on repeatability, predictability. This should be something where we, we know exactly how long it's gonna take, roughly, how long it's gonna take to build this software, and the software is going to be reliable when I do it. There is a defined process that we follow, we are in this step, we are gonna to move to the next step. This could be very important if you, have a, if you have a distributed team, particularly a globally distributed team, and you don't have the ability to just kind of change things on the fly. Everyone needs to stay on the same page. Documentation does tend to be a part, more a part of plan-driven, often because plan-driven software goes through certification phases. So 
something that the FDA has to look at, something that FAA has to look at if it's air, airline software. Um, you tend to design your, your software up front, so you often will do more design documents, like more class diagrams, more sequence diagrams. This could be because you need to map out the key data paths, like how, are, how is data going to be encrypted and decrypted and how are we storing it and you know, to show, to prove that you are building the software the best way that you can. Uh, people tend to have more defined roles in the team where you say, this is the requirements team, this is the design team, this is the uh, development team. Uh, whereas in an agile environment, you tend to have smaller teams. So everyone kind of does a little bit of everything. Um, if you have a larger team, you have more specialists. And so this makes sense. You also, you have more risk management where you say, okay, because we know exactly what our plan is going to be, if we are going to slip a month, we know what the cost is going to be in person hours, in dollars, however you do that. And they focus on verification and validation, making sure that the software is correct and is always working. So as you can see, plan-driven development is really built around, we are making software that just has to work. This is not, you know, um, grandma's, recipe share 9000 that's going to be this sweet web app that has a, a connection into reddit or whatever it might be and a discord bot just for fun this is going to be something that is you know people's lives probably depend on it so we need to double and triple check to make sure we're building it correctly the rational unified process is the is the plan driven methodology we're going to talk about mainly because rup is just kind of this generic catch-all for plan-driven processes and it's probably the one that i've seen the most at least out out in the out in the in the field um again everything is customizable so someone might not even say they're using rational they're, they're just using different aspects of what it means so rational was created you know not terribly long ago you know a little over 40 around 40 years ago and um the company that came up with rational the guy that came up with with with, with rational um ended up being purchased into a company called Rational. I think that's when it actually got its real name. And the cool thing about that company was they were big on, well, if we can formally specify the design, the requirement, excuse me, uh, you know, write down, okay, if this, then this, if this, then this, this model does this, 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 then couldn't we press a button and have it just generate a diagram? or then take that diagram and press a button and it has, just generates the code, automatic code generation. If we know that the design document, the design diagram is correct, I mean, I don't need to write getters and setters for everything, can't we just do this? And so IBM saw this and thought this was pretty cool. Turns out they purchased it and started building it into their tool set, which at the time and is now Eclipse. So UML, uh, the Unified Modeling Language, which we'll talk about more later in the design, is, is a drawing language where you can specify how software will be built. And there were drawing tools that were built into uh, Eclipse as plugins that allow you to do automatic code generation in Java. Um, so the idea was you work on a big team, um, the requirements people come in, they get, they get the requirements, they figure out uh, what the software is going to do through specification. Then they work with the design team to come up with, okay, this is the class diagram. This is this model. This is going to interact here. Here's how things flow. Button. And then a quarter of the code base, the, the code base that you never want to write, the getters, the setters, the class headers, all of that stuff, just auto poof into existence. Okay, sure. That sounds great. Um, and if you're working in a large team, maybe that's something you like. Maybe that's something you care about. Now, rational process itself uh, has this idea of, six best practices, and then their own version of phases of development. So first, the best practices, we want to develop software iteratively. Now, remember we talked about Spiral in the last video, about that being the evolution of the waterfall, the idea that we want to be able to, to iterate over and over and over and constantly improve. And you might have thought, well, that must, you know, Sheriff, you just spent all this time saying you have to get the requirements right. That doesn't mean you can't still iterate, but you can iterate inside of the phases. I'll show what that means in a second. Uh, we want to manage the requirements. So we want to be able to track any changes to requirements very carefully so we understand how that affects the rest of the software. Use component-based architectures. The idea here is that uh, when we're building something larger, if we have a module we have already built that we know does 
X, like maybe a payment processing system, we don't reinvent the wheel. We don't rebuild that. We just take that giant Lego brick of code and use that in our system. Reduces the amount of time and also makes maintenance easier down the road. Visually modeling software, I already mentioned that. The idea of the drawing the diagram, automatically generate the code. Verify the software quality as much as possible. Heavy on testing. Heavy on, if possible, even proving. In some languages, you can prove the code works. And then control changes to software. It's not that you don't do this in Agile, the idea of, I have new code, I'm going to make a pull request. Um, but when I was, I, I worked at Wachovia for a little bit um, as an intern, and one of the things that we had to do, if we were pushing code there, we actually had to have a vice president sign off on our change request. Now that sounds impressive, but you couldn't swing a dead cat and not hit seven vice presidents at this particular area I was sitting in. So, eh, eh. But the idea was that there was more of a set of controls on how software changed. Now their phases are the inception, elaboration, construction, and transition phases. So each phase has a way that it you know, turns into the next phase, but then within each phase, you want to iterate into itself before you move to the next one. Let's, um, so within those phases of workflows, a particular task that increased it. Yeah, so once you're inside a phase, um, you might be at the beginning of a phase where you're gonna do more work, you might be at the end of the phase when you are trying to transition to the next one. It it uh, it evolves as the as the as the project moves forward. And um, let me just show you the, the the diagram. This was the slide I thought was next. <laughs> so here are our phases. Now each one of those I one E one E two those are iterations. So let's say you have a a really big team. Okay, so you have the business modeling team, which let's just say those are the those are the um, biz dev people, those are the people that go out, go out and find the new projects to work on. The requirements are the people that will come in and you know work with the customer, work with the stakeholders to figure out exactly what it is that they want. Analysis and design, the design process, implementation, the coding process, testing, and then deployment. So in the inception phase, the business modeling team is spending most of their time here as they are trying to you know, drum up um, new, a new client. And they might pull in the requirements team in there and say, hey, why don't you come, you know, let's, let's have a lunch. Let's do a little chat, a little chat, see what's going on here. Maybe they bring in on occasion like, oh, this is a member of our design team. This is a member of our implementation team. They would love to get the new account with Procter & Gamble or whatever it might be and yada, yada, yada. So let's say you've landed that big account. Congratulations. Um, you're now in the elaboration phase. So the elaboration phase is now when you are figuring out what the requirements are. So you can see that the business modeling team is still heavily involved because, hey, they're the people that landed the big account. They're the ones that they are the main contact between you, uh, your team, and the customer. But now the requirements team has really spiked in the amount of effort that they are doing. And so did the analysis and design team because now you are iterating on, all right, this is what we're going to build. These are the requirements. This is the design. Here's how it's going to work. Yada, 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 do a, do a couple iterations of this. You could do this three, four, five times. Go back to the customer, make sure they have what they want. Finally, as elaboration is tailor, tapering off, the business modeling team says, all right, landed that account. You, you dev boys and girls, good to go. All right, so y'all take that over. Go build that awesome software. We're going to go find the next big account. So as requirements and business modeling start tapering off and the implement, implementation team starts you know, spiking in their amount of effort, the business modeling team and the requirements team are now going off and finding the next account. So the idea is that you have this constantly rolling development process where there's always the business modeling team and the requirements are finding the next account. Analysis, design, implementation, implementation are working on something. And then towards the end, after all of those construction phases, you can see how implementation slowly tapering off requirements. All those are slowly tapering off because on occasion, you'll still have to go back to the customer and say, hey, what did you mean by this? Um, then deployment starts spiking so that you can then transition to giving that software to the customer, deploying it, whatever it might be. Meanwhile, you've landed the next account and now you, you're starting on the next big project. So um, this is a really cool way of thinking about it from a, from a business perspective. Um, if you are working with a very large team with specialists in marketing, specialists in, in customer relations, in, in um, UX design, uh, user experience design, this makes a lot of sense because you want them to be able to focus on what they're good at, but you also don't want them to be just sitting idle. You don't want them to have to 
you know, okay, are we almost done releasing this before we start the next project? No, you want them going off and finding the next thing that, that your team is going to do. So long story short, TLDR, plan-driven processes are good for projects in which the requirements are less likely to change. If you look at a project and you say, wow, we've got to get this right up front, know exactly what we're building, and it, the likelihood of it changing is, is really low. You're working with a piece of hardware, there's um, approval processes, there's um, security considerate, like serious security considerations, you're probably going to be more plan driven. For agile, it's the opposite. As teams grow in size and distribution, plan driven helps people work effectively together. If you have a document or a set of documents or a set of um, processes, rules that everyone knows to follow, then even if your team is distributed across the country or across the globe, it's easier for people to keep up with what's going on as opposed to just kind of haphazardly chatting in the Slack channel as to, okay, what are we working on next? In general, plan-driven processes tend to be better for newer developers because they don't have to come in and know everything. They're, they're given more of a specific role and here's how you're gonna work within the team and you don't have to stress about it quite as much. So something to consider right there. Not that that doesn't mean that you can't go into an agile environment and be very, very successful. Um, many of you can and will do that, but general rule, we kind of look at it this way. And then if you have a lot of parts of the project that have to be integrated, a um, lot of testing, plan-driven makes a ton of sense. So that's the basics of what it means to have a plan-driven process. In the next video, I'm gonna talk about agile processes and then we'll compare and contrast them. And then we'll start getting down to, well, given a project, how do you make that decision? So again, it's a good day. It's a good day to wear a mask. Hope you're staying safe out there. Great to talk to you as always. Bye.